this session is Mrs. Machon, I hope I got it right now, <laughs> from a uh, former um, uh, MI5 okay. official. Thank you very much for inviting me to um, make a statement to this committee. I'm going to be talking a bit about the UK setup, the intelligence world, and the legal regulations and restrictions, and also around the, what happens to whistleblowers coming out of UK intelligence. I then have a few recommendations which I would respectfully like to put in front of the committee, which I would hope would generate a little more discussion later on this afternoon. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the UK intelligence setup, our agencies have been around much longer than the U US. Uh, they're just over 100 years old now, and for the first 80 years of their existence, they didn't officially exist. Our members of parliament were not allowed to ask questions to find out what they were doing. And a law was put in place soon after their inception in 1911, the very first official Secrets Act, which was there to try and prevent the leaking and betrayal of national security secrets to our enemy powers. If you were found guilty under this law, you were a traitor and you received 14 years in prison. And this law is still in place. However, after their 80 years of, as the 80s spy catcher novelist, uh, writer Peter Wright once said, bugging and burgling their way around London with impunity, in the 1980s, there were a series of whistleblowing scandals, and as a result of this, some more laws were put in place, which were key to the later development of what I want to talk about today. First of all, the, the Official Secrets Act was updated. Because of the whistleblowing scandals in the 1980s, they stripped out what had existed before, which was if someone blew the whistle, they could exercise a public interest defense. This was removed from the 89 Act, and what was put in place is what the lawyers call a clear, bright line against disclosure, which means that if you are a former or serving intelligence officer, you automatically break the law if you talk about your work to anyone outside the agency for which you work. However, at the same time, in 1989, they set up the Security Service Act to regulate the work of MI5 to a more democratic degree. And then in 1994, MI6, the uh, International Intelligence Gathering Agency, and our listening post, GCHQ, were also put on a legal footing with the 1994 Intelligence Services Act. And this act was key as well, because for the very first time, it set in place a, parliament, uh, a committee in Parliament, which was supposedly to have some sort of notional oversight of the work of the intelligence agencies. However, until this year, that committee, the Intelligence and Security Committee, has been toothless because it was only able to investigate policy, finance, and administration. And as other scandals have unfolded in the last 20 years, they were unable to call for witnesses from the intelligence agencies, subpoena them, demand access to documents, or to investigate allegations of crime. So that's the, the current framework in the UK. And it's ironic, I find it somewhat ironic to be discussing the UK now, as of course, they are very much the partners in crime, apparently, uh, looking at the current NSA revelations from Edward Snowden. So I worked for MI5 in the 1990s, and this is why it was crucial to have all these new laws put in place when I joined, because it was probably the most ethical era of MI5's 100-year existence. Suddenly they're on a legal footing for the first time, and this is before the tragic events of 9-11, when the intelligence gloves came off. And yet, despite that, I and my former partner, a man called David Shaler, saw so many things going wrong in the six years we worked for MI5 that we felt compelled to resign and compelled to blow the whistle. We had raised our concerns on the inside, as had many of our peer group who were all resigning in record numbers around the same time. And yet, we were told to shut up, not rock the boat, and just follow orders. There was no effective avenue for ventilation outside the intelligence agencies. So David Shaler and I, I helped him, decided to blow the whistle on a whole series of crimes that we saw being committed. And these sort of escalated over our years in MI5, starting with files on our government ministers, the very people who are supposed to hold the spies to account, had secret information held on them by the spies. There were illegal phone taps of left-wing journalists, innocent people put in prison when MI5 had information that indicated they could be innocent, but they withheld it from the trial. IRA bombs that could and should have been prevented going off on UK streets, and then MI5 lying to government to cover up its mistakes. 
And most crucially for us, this was the case that made us quit, was MI6's involvement in funding a terrorist operation in Libya to try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi in 1996. This went wrong. It was illegal under UK law, and innocent people were killed. We could not think of a more heinous act to have witnessed, and this is why we decided to resign and blow the whistle. And we knew we faced prosecution under the 1989 Official Secrets Act by going public. So we went literally on the run, a bit like Edward Snowden. And we had to live in hiding in France for a year, and then live in exile in France for another two years, because MI5 was trying to prosecute us. David, in fact, was prosecuted. He went to prison not once but twice. First of all, when the UK failed to extradite him from France to stand trial under the Official Secrets Act in 1988. And then, secondly, after he had returned to the UK voluntarily to stand trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act, and he was found guilty in 2002. So it was a, a very frightening experience to go through. And, of course, we had to give up our, our jobs, our career prospects, our very way of life and, of course, risk prison. And it wasn't just us who did that. David, as I said, went to prison. I was arrested, but his brother was arrested. His two best friends were arrested. Journalists were arrested and threatened with prosecution around this case for daring to expose the crimes of the spies. It was also a salutary lesson to us as well for what it's like to live under a state of constant possible surveillance, where you can't feel that you can have a private telephone conversation or send private emails where you can't feel that you can have a private conversation in the privacy of your own home, even your bedroom. And also potentially where your friends may be pressured to report on you. And that's what it would be like to live under a Stasi-type state. And that's how we felt we had to live for a number of years. What was also interesting around the case was looking at how the media, who notionally should be able to hold the spies to account, could also be legally controlled. There is a raft of legislation in the UK that can be used to threaten the media and is indeed being used at the moment to stifle media debate about the Edward Snowden case. These include injunctions, super injunctions where you can't even discuss there is an injunction. There are um, public interest immunity certificates that the government can use which are like injunctions. They use the Terrorism Act to threaten journalists. They also have a voluntary system called the D-Notice Committee, and a D-Notice has been issued to stifle legitimate debate within our mainstream media about Edward Snowden. Finally, of course, it's not just the whistleblower in UK law who faces prosecution. Also, our journalists can be prosecuted under Section 5 of the 1989 Whistleblowers Act if they cause damage to national security by reporting the stories given to them by the whistleblowers. This is more draconian even than in Russia today. So it's a bit of a mess in the UK. Um, there is notional oversight provision. For example, we do have the ISC, Intelligence and Security Committee, which I mentioned, but they have been largely toothless. And also many stories have emerged over the last decade to show that senior spies have admitted to getting away with lying to that committee. Because they can, because the committee has no way of forcing the issue. The idea there is not some notional democratic oversight. For example, if MI5 wants to bug our communications, then theoretically they have to get a home office warrant signed off by the minister who's their boss. Unfortunately, the, the politician only <coughs> gets to see a summary of a summary of a summary of a summary of the intelligence case and it's very easy for the spies to big up that intelligence case and ensure that they get the permission required. They can also go for what are called omnibus warrants. And that is what I think we are seeing, for example, with the GCHQ use of the tempera um, surveillance technique, which William Hague, our current foreign secretary, said of course was legal. Of course there was oversight under the ISA. But in fact, this seems to be in nebulous legal ground because if this is an omnibus warrant covering millions or billions of communications, then one warrant being signed off every six months automatically is not efficient oversight. So why is whistleblowing important in the UK? We don't have a written constitution. This is one of the, the issues that came up before. We don't have a written constitution, and we have effectively the least accountable and most legally protected of all intelligence communities in the Western world. And because of this incredibly closed 
mindset, we get a sort of groupthink building up on the inside. If you're told not to rock the boat, told not to question ethical decisions, then those who do have ethical qualms often resign, and those who don't stay and get promoted. And I think this is what we've seen, for example, with the allegations of MI5 and MI6 being involved in torture cases over the last decade, since 9-11. In the 1990s, the spies did not use torture. It was unethical and it was ineffectual and it created blowback. And they'd learned this lesson the hard way in Northern Ireland in the 1970s. However, suddenly after 9-11, they seem to have forgotten those lessons. And perhaps this sort of closed mindset, this groupthink, self-perpetuating oligarchy and lack of ventilation allow them to take that moral slide down towards involvement in torture again. So whistleblowers can add, or ventilation can add, a very powerful check to that sort of dangerous moral slide, in my opinion. There's also, of course, a war on whistleblowers going on, particularly in the US, where I think Obama has used the Espionage Act more times to try and persecute whistleblowers in his brief presidency than all other presidents since 1917 combined. This is nothing if not a war on whistleblowers. And yet it contrasts, in my mind, very starkly with the treatment meted out to real spies. You'll probably remember the Russian spy ring, the illegals who were caught in America in 2010. And yet a deal was done and they were handed over to Russia with no prosecution under this Espionage Act, which is wheeled out time and again to persecute whistleblowers, legitimate whistleblowers in the US. And I think this hypocrisy is breathtaking. And I think we need whistleblowers now. With this encroaching surveillance state, with this global surveillance um, dystopia that is gradually emerging from the Snowden revelations, and also, of course, with the spread of other questionable activities around the world, things like CIA kill lists, the assassination of terrorist suspects without due process by the use of drones, um, the invasion of sovereign countries on dubious intelligence, which in, in the past, for example, with the invasion of Iraq, has been proven to have been based on lies. All these things cry out for the need for greater accountability and greater transparency. And it's only by having those two key aspects can we hope for greater justice. So what would be some recommendations I would like to throw into the process, to throw into the debate? Because we're looking at the legal protection of whistleblowers. And one thing, particularly in the UK, I would suggest, is that we need meaningful, power, um, meaningful parliamentary oversight, real parliamentary oversight. We need a parliamentary, a parliamentary committee which is elected by Parliament, not appointed by the Prime Minister, which has full, wide-ranging legal powers to take the evidence of whistleblowers, to allow them a legal channel to go to, so they don't have to turn their lives inside out by exposing the crimes of the spies. We also need, we need the fact that this committee in Parliament would be trusted by the whistleblowers to carry out a real and effective um, investigation into any allegations of malfeasance by the spies. And this would include a full inquiry conducted, evidence gathered and taken from all sides, reforms applied, and indeed crimes, if they are found to have been committed, to be punished. At this stage, it's very easy for the spies and the spy masters to cover up and lie when they're caught out doing something wrong. <clears throat> I would also suggest that certainly in the UK, we need a legal definition of what constitutes national security because we don't currently have that under the law. And much, much is made of, we need to protect national security. And often the spies will conflate that with the national interest, which is not a reason to shut up whistleblowers and impede their freedom of expression under, under Article 10.2 of the European Convention of Human Rights. So we need a proper legal definition and a, an understanding as well that to protect national security means that you have to protect the integrity and the future existence of your nation state. So the odd bomb going off on the streets is traumatizing and terrible, but it does not threaten the national integrity of the state. Some other quick suggestions. One would be, of course, there was some very good evidence put in by um, Duncan Campbell about the echelon report from 10 years ago. That needs, in my view, to be revisited. It was a perfect opportunity for Europe to build its own key um, communications infrastructure, to break away from the American hegemony, and also to provide protection for its citizens. 
and also to try and ensure that the US complies with the European Convention on Human Rights and our standards within our communities and countries. Finally, and just quickly to conclude, we need technology policies that allow us to protect ourselves if our states won't do that for us. So, for example, if we are unable to protect ourselves on the communications network, what we can do is take steps as individual citizens to protect ourselves, take our own steps, move away from the US proprietary closed corporate software systems and develop our own because it would be good for our EU economy too. And finally, why do we all do this as whistleblowers? Just to finish, we need free media, we need a free internet, because if we don't have that, if we can't read and write and listen and discuss ideas freely and in privacy, we are indeed living in an Orwellian dystopia and we're all potentially at risk. The central societal function of privacy in our communications is not just so that we can chat away to each other with nobody eavesdropping, although it's very corrosive to feel that you are being surveyed and listened to all the time, as I've experienced personally myself. But privacy, private communications, is the bedrock and defense against encroaching surveillance states and potentially encroaching extremist states. And as we've seen, for example, the rise of Golden Dawn in Greece, who can say where our polit political systems will take us in future? And this is why we need to protect and ensure our privacy now. So just as a final comment, I would suggest that there is no balance between privacy and security is the um, argument that the spies and the intelligence agencies always bring out. They trot it out that we have to get this balance between privacy and security. I would suggest this is a false dichotomy. We need that privacy in order to have that security that we will not be predated on by potentially hostile powers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to open the uh, question and answer session to Mr. Drake and Ms. Marchon. Uh, we, we do the usual routine. So, um, 